a very good evening everyone hope all is going good and you are on your tracks you're following a strict schedule you're following a strict discipline we are just a month apart just few days to go and everything is on the track and if it is not on the track as of now it needs to go on the track asap that is what is the need of the hour it's just few days to pull your socks to fasten your seat belts and just go about it don't think what is going around in the world everything will come back after few days everything will be more fancy more beautiful but what we need right now is what we need the results we need to put in that effort so that we can get the best out of it uh good evening rishi raj uh, and yogesh so if the audio visual is working well if all is good if you can just give me a confirmation so that we can get started uh and well as i told you that there is an advanced course uh, on ophthalmology which is targeting fmge students and mind the aspirants that is uh, planned for the month of july i have all the details the topics to be covered in that uh, towards the end of this session so you can see or you can visit the unacademy app for the same all right uh, all right so good i have so many confirmations coming up um happy to see that uh, sure so let's get started so basically this is the point where we left last time and um, i told you well uh, this should not be a problem right now so uh, this is where i left and i asked you you have to identify this instrument and um, i'm sure the ones who have attended my session on ophthalmic equipment series 1 uh, on the an academy app which was a free session will be knowing this oh yes that i have got baljinder very good so this is dr priyanka very nice so this is the calazion clamp so this is the calazion clamp absolutely so for the details for how to identify where do we give the incision where does the ring plate come where does the flat plate come everything is available on the app which is a free session it is a free special class which is available on ophthalmic equipments so all those who want to learn more about this which is this is series 1 so all those who want to learn more about the equipment i have tried to cover uh, as many as i could in that one hour and that that's a series of lectures so we'll continue with them the next month also so anyway so this is the calazion clamp and so now i have so many answers coming up i'm so happy to hear that good all right so we need to we move on to the next slide so now you have to tell me which muscle is affected so the question needs that you need to answer is which muscle is affected and which is the nerve supply of the muscle affected here so these are the two questions so how will you interpret such pictures so um, the biggest problem that i normally get to hear from everyone is that it is it gets very overwhelming when we see so many pictures lined up together so always start with always start with the slide which has the primary position the slide which has the primary position because that tells you whether we are dealing with eso or we are dealing with exo half of the work finishes when you start with the primary position so that is my advice uh all right so i have so many responses well i would always ask you to look at the primary position let's go one by one so if i see so let's let me name it so this is the image a this is the image b and this is the image c now there are a lot of mixed responses which are coming all right so baljinder has answered all right so but let's see how to interpret such uh, questions so first thing that you have to do is you look in the primary position so tell me in the primary position whether we are dealing with eso exo or what what do we see in the primary position what do we see in the primary position so we have this is the right eye and this is the left eye 
So basically, what do we see in the primary position? Just answer me this. We see, so let's, let's see. So now what do we see? We see left ESO. All right. This is what we are finding. We are not saying the right eye is affected or the left eye is affected. That is point later. So first, let's see what we are dealing with right now in the primary position is left ESO. One thing. Okay. Absolutely good. So that is right compilobacter. Then we come to image A. So now when we see an image A, this is the right eye and this is left eye. So if we move here, that means when I have the dextroversion, the eye moves, there is abduction of the right eye and there is adduction of the left eye. Right? So abduction of the right, adduction of the left is absolutely normal. Right? So that is okay. Just tick it. Done. Checklist. Then we come to the third image, which is C. Now, when you see the Levo version, what do we see? When we see the Levo version, what do we see? We see that the right eye is moving well, but the left eye, there is no abduction. So let's write down. So right eye movement here is also full and here is also full. So we cut the right eye. Now when we see the left eye, the left eye ESO is happening. So the left eye uh, adduction is happening. But what is affected? Left eye abduction is affected. So, when we come to left eye abduction, so what is left eye abduction? Uh, which muscle is responsible for that? Now you tell me. So, when we talk of the left eye abduction or abduction is means the left eye going out. When this movement is affected, so which muscle is involved in the left eye abduction? Tell me which muscle is involved. It is which muscle is involved? It is left lateral rectus. Is that clear? So now, so when you say this movement is affected, so this action is left lateral rectus. Yes. So do you, do you get that? So this is how you come. So first of all, always look at the primary position and then take one movement each at a time. So the action of the uh, uh, extraocular muscles is a very important topic. And we have discussed it so many times in our sessions, how to remember it. The, uh, the, the thing that you need to remember is the extraocular muscles. I'll just write it down so that you all know it well and there are no glimpses. So when we have extraocular muscles, what is important? So this is very important. You should know their origin insertion you should know the nerve supply okay then you need to know the action of the muscles by action you should know which is the primary action secondary action and the tertiary action these are three important things that you should know so the origin insertion the nerve supply and the action of the muscles is very very important you should know it separately, which is primary, which is secondary, and which is the tertiary action. And we have all learned the mnemonics about them. We have all learned about the extraocular muscles so many times in the strabismus lecture. Those who do not remember, go back to that session and just revise it once. Okay? Yes, LR6SO4. So when you know this, you know everything. So here the muscle affected is, so the answer we come down to the muscle is left lateral rectus and which muscle supplies the lateral rectus it which which nerve supplies it is the sixth nerve we all know lr6 so4 lateral rectus is supplied by the sixth nerve and superior oblique is supplied by the fourth nerve and we did which muscle lies outside the cone tell me 
which muscle uh, which nerve lies outside the muscle cone we did it the last time it is the fourth nerve it is which supplies the superior oblique so you know how to remember this is very good i am so happy so it is the abducens which is responsible for abduction you remember this so abducens nerve is responsible for the muscle for abduction so that is an easier way to remember that's an easier way to remember okay all right so done with that good so now we move on to the next one so whenever we talk of the paralytic strabismus always remember three characteristics of paralytic strabismus which is very very important so what are the three characteristics of paralytic strabismus three characteristics are incompetence anyone who wants to attend for the second and third anjum good evening we're already started so you can see this uh, slides which you have missed later but let's continue with this so first is incompetence second is restriction of movement and the third most important is the primary deviation and secondary deviation this is the most important so incompetence you all know so what is incompetence that the uh, the deviation varies with gaze so these are the characteristics of paralytic strabismus you all know what is incompetence so incompetence is when the the deviation varies in different gazes obviously so the deviation would be maximum in the uh, gaze of the muscle involved right like for example in left lateral rectus the deviation would be maximum when we are looking towards the left side restriction of the movement so the movement on that side of the involved extraocular muscle is restricted that is also clear and third and uh, the most important as i said so there's a primary deviation and there's a secondary deviation now you tell me in paralytic strabismus which is more is it the primary deviation more than secondary deviation or the secondary deviation is more than the primary deviation so you have to answer in the chat box which is more is it primary or is it secondary deviation tell me i'm waiting for the answer so tell me tell me i'm waiting so which is more so you all know what is primary deviation primary deviation is when the normal eye fixates and secondary deviation is when the affected eye fixates so now you tell me which is more absolutely very good srk faraz very nice so it is the secondary deviation please note the secondary deviation is much more than the primary deviation and you know the reason why right so if you remember this why it is never possible for you to not remember on the point of you know the maximum stress you all know why so these are the characteristics of paralytic strabismus so there is incompetence incompetence there is restriction of the movement and the secondary deviation is more than the primary deviation so this is paralytic strabismus so competent and competent strabismus and competent strabismus importance is sixth nerve very very important for you then you can have third nerve we have learned all the uh, you know uh, all the pseudo one graphase assign aberrant regenerations with the third nerve you should know so that is an important topic all right so then we come down to uh, s for secondary uh, so uh, uh, i didn't get that so how do you remember that uh, that secondary is more is there a mnemonic that you're trying to explain i couldn't get that s for secondary and s for what then Mm, I didn't get that, so you need to explain it to me. All right. So now you have to identify what you see on the screen. I'll just zoom it, and now you tell me what is this? Which type of cataract is this? 
Okay, Med Psycho says, yes, it is. There is some kind of a mnemonic that he is trying to tell me. All right, so you tell me what does S, S for secondary and S for what does that mean? Strabismus. Okay, all right. So that, that I take it. Okay, so now here, what? No, this is not corneal mar uh, marker device. No, it is not corneal marker device. Go back and see in that image, on that session, how, how does the corneal uh, marker device looks. So if you see this, okay, I'll give you a hint. This is a kind of a cataract. Now you tell me. Okay, so the second hint that comes is this is a kind of a pediatric or a developmental cataract. So, and I'm telling you, the next hint I give you, you all will start answering. That's all right, Spiljan. That's absolutely normal. That's There's no point to say sorry. I said it was always better to mistakes, to make mistakes here, to, you know, uh, say whatever you think here, because then you can see why it is not that. Rather than, you know, thinking or making mistakes on the important day. All right. So now you have to tell me anybody who wants to attend. This is cartwheel. Okay. So which kind of. Uh, it is a good looking cat, right? All right. So my last hit comes is then you will all know it. So this is the cat rack. This is the kind of a developmental cat rack, which is most common type of cat rack. affecting vision now tell me so the one which is the most common type which affects vision tell me and these are called as riders or Spokes. It is a developmental cataract. It is a pediatric cataract. It is a congenital cataract. So, which out of the congenital or the pediatric or the developmental cataracts is the most common variety which affects the visual acuity? It is the cataract which has riders or appears like the spokes of a wheel and it is called as the zonular or lamellar cataract. It is called the zonular or the lamellar cataract. So rubella, rubella is one causative factor in the etiology it can be malnutrition it can be vitamin d deficiency it can be maternal infections right so zonular or the lamellar cataract is the form of the pediatric cataract which presents as riders or spokes and it is the most common variety of developmental cataract which results in visual affection or which results in a significant reduction in the vision is that clear so now this, this should not be wrong. Okay. And the most common type of cataract which does not affect the vision is? Most common kind of pediatric cataract or developmental cataract which does not affect the vision is? Tell me, which what kind of a cataract does not affect the vision? That is the blue dot cataract. Okay. So now this, this point should be absolutely clear. The one which affects the vision? is the lamellar or the zonular cataract. The one which does not affect the vision is the, uh, is the blue dot cataract. Okay? All right. So then we move on to the, this. This is a long question, but let's see. This is just to practice. How do you solve the longer questions? So a 28-year-old boy suffered a road traffic accident. He suffered a road traffic accident in which he had the facial trauma. There was penetrating injury to the right eye, which was repaired timely, but eventually was PL denied in right eye. Three years later, he came back with complaints of episodes of diminution of vision in the left eye. 
Now, please pay attention. Examination revealed posterior synecae and the below shown image. What are we dealing with? So, just pay attention here. So, here the question talks about a boy who had an RTA, that is a road traffic accident, and had a penetrating injury in eye 1, that is in right eye. What went to the damage that it was PL denied in the right eye. But three years down the line, he is presenting with complaints in the left eye, the other eye. So now what you see in the left eye is shown in the image. So what are we dealing with? Okay, so you say phacoanaphylactic uveitis. Okay, so please do not forget there are, there are certain significant things which I would like to mark here. Penetrating injury to right eye. Episodes of diminution of vision in the left eye. Does that make any connection? Baljinder says C. Dr. Tanuja says C. Phacoenaphylactic uveitis. So if you talk of phacoenaphylactic uveitis, the question here does not talk about any KPs, any granulomatous infection. And what it is talking about is the posterior segment presentation. So now what you have is the patient has posterior synecae and what he has is this in the fundus. So it is just not phacoenaphylactic uveitis which is but it is uveitis as a whole. So what are we dealing with? Pan uveitis. So now do you get this anywhere closer? Absolutely. So now you have to remember when we talk of the right eye Pay attention. When we are talking of the right eye, the right eye which got the trauma was the exciting eye. And then it led to symptoms in the other eye. So left eye is called as the sympathizing eye. And it leads to this image. So what are these? These are called as Dalen Fuchs Not Fuchs. Now I want the answer from all of you. What are we dealing with? Still there, is a, there are doubts. There are different answers. So now after this if I write down trauma to one eye, which is called as the exciting eye, after some time, there are symptoms in the other eye, which is presenting as pan-uveitis, which is presenting as pan-uveitis with dalen fuchs nodules is what are we dealing with? Absolutely. What we are dealing with is we are dealing with sympathetic ophthalmitis. Very good. This is what we are dealing with. So it is characteristic that affection in the one eye leads to symptoms in the other eye. When you talk of phacoenaphylactic uveitis, the biggest point against this is so what happens with phacoenaphylactic uveitis? We know there has to be a time period again here which is the period for sensitization. But then it does not affect the other eye. It happens in the same eye which was traumatized or which had surgery where the lens immune proteins were exposed and it is an autoimmune reaction in the same eye. So that is phacoenaphylactic uveitis. Okay, where you get phacoenaphylaxis, you get granulomatous inflammation, where you have KPs, where you will have phacotoxic glaucoma. But here, what is happening is, please note, characteristically, he has mentioned that there is injury to the right eye and the left eye is presenting now. So it is the other eye which is presenting and the other eye is shown in the images and hence it is sympathetic ophthalmitis. 
Yes, it is a rare case. But when you sit in the exam, when you have to write the exam, it is one of the very important topics. Sympathetic ophthalmologist is a very, very important topic. How it presents, what is the HLA association, what are the nodules that we get, what are the ocular manifestations, and what is the treatment. Five questions when you sit down, you should know about sympathetic ophthalmologist. Because you, though it is rare with the uh, newer medications, but from the exam point of view, it is a very important topic. Okay, so it should be read well read, it should be well completed. All right, so now we move on to the next one. Now you tell me, identify which disease are we dealing with. So we have a bachu. So there's a small child who's presenting with. So if you see carefully, he is presenting with cat rat. He is presenting with cat rat. And the biggest hint here is with salt and pepper retinopathy with some kind of a ESO right so what are we dealing with the most probable diagnosis in such cases is where you have if you try to see there is a congenital cataract there is salt and pepper retinopathy there is a child who is presenting with this is what absolutely this is rubella when you talk of syphilis syphilis would not have a syndrome here when you talk of cataract with salt and pepper retinopathy you will think of rubella as the first when if i hide the congenital cataract if i hide the cataract in this child and i just present to you salt and pepper retinopathy then the differentials would be a strong differential would be syphilis but once it comes with cataract and salt and pepper retinopathy the most probable diagnosis that should come first is the maternal rubella infection and what we get here is the rubella so what is the disease that we are dealing with we are dealing with rubella infection so rubella is something which presents with this so what i need to tell you here is what are the ocular manifestations what are the ocular manifestations of congenital rubella syndrome what is crs it is cherry red spot also and it is called as here we are dealing with congenital rubella syndrome okay so now what are the ocular manifestations the mnemonic to remember we all know it is cat mouse and kid go eat salt and pepper so this you should never forget so what are the ocular manifestations the ocular manifestations are cataract microspherophagia keratitis glaucoma salt and pepper retinopathy yes so is that clear now so whenever you get a combination of this you should always remember rubella that's very very important right so cat mouse and kid go eat salt and pepper is that clear so that should not be made that should not be a mistake again cat mouse and kid now you all write it in the chat box and then you will remember this mnemonic so write it down cat mouse and kid go eat salt and pepper is that clear so write it down in the right write it down in the chat box so that you remember this mnemonic right cat mouse and kid go eat salt and pepper so this is important all right so the next one that we have is not true of complicated cataract is now tell me polychromatic luster breadcrumb appearance posterior subcapsular cataract or krukenberg spindle yeah dr tanuja has made it so fancy with all the new uh, 
you know pictures uh, put in with all the emojis put in that is a nice way to remember good all right so now you answer this question not true of complicated cataract is Tell me what is the answer. Polychromatic cluster, breadcrumb appearance, posterior subcapsular cataract or a Krukenberg spindle. So when we talk of complicated cataract, just see what are we talking about. We are talking about complicated cataract. Yes. So, Campylobacter says answer is D. Krukenberg spindle. Anybody who wants to differ, in, differ any who differs um, from him, okay, Dr. Swami all says it is B. Breadcrumb appearance. Uh, okay, I have got another answers which who say D. All right. So, when we talk of complicated cataract, complicated cataract is the term which is given to the, it is a kind of a posterior subcapsular cataract, which is associated with other ocular morbidities. Right. So, complicated cataract is a kind of posterior subcapsular cataract, which can be seen in a lot of diseases like in uveitis, in any ocular inflammation. In cases of uh, complicated cataract is also seen in cases of myotonic dystrophy. In patients of in like high myopes, in retinal detachments, right? So you get you get to see in a lot of uh, diseases. So it is a kind of a posterior subcapsular cataract which presents as polychromatic luster or as iridescent crystals. So by that we mean it has a, it, it shines like rainbow. It has multiple colors to it. That is why we call it as poly, which means many. Chromatic means colors. So it has a polychromatic luster so when we you are absolutely right when we talk of the myotonic dystrophy that time it is called as the it gives it is the christmas tree cataract that is the fancy name when we associate this posterior subcapsular cataract or complicated cataract with myotonic dystrophy christmas tree cataract so whenever we talk of a complicated cataract it is a kind of a posterior subcapsular cataract which has a polychromatic cluster which has iridescent crystals and has a breadcrumb appearance so the answer here is krukenberg spindle krukenberg spindle is something which is not seen in complicated cataract and what is a Krukenberg spindle? Krukenberg spindle is nothing but it is the vertical, it is the deposition of the pigments in a vertical spindle-like manner on the cornea. And where do you get to see this? Where do you get to see Krukenberg spindle? Anybody who wants to attend? Where did you get to see the Krukenberg spindle in? Which disease? Medico VH. Good evening. Good evening. You're joining now. So we are already through a lot of um, slides. You can go back and see them later. So which disease do you get to see the Krukenberg spindle? So Krukenberg spindle is seen in anyone who wants to attempt pigment dispersion syndrome. Right. So this is seen in pigment dispersion syndrome all right so this is krukenberg spindle so answer here is krukenberg spindle then we come to which of the following drugs act on the trabecular mesh which of the following drugs act on the trabecular mesh is it brimonidine nitarsudil timolol or a prostaglandin analog now tell me
okay so uh, the answer comes is prostaglandin analogs so i would say go back and see the question i'm what i'm talking about is acting on the trabecular meshwork so whenever we talk of just note whenever we talk of the outflow system we have two systems for outflow one is the conventional trabecular outflow system and the other is the uveoscleral outflow right yes so latanoprost by matoprost when you're talking about prostaglandin analogs they act on the uveoscleral outflow now you have to tell me out of these two systems which is a and b this is a and this is b which is the one which is majorly responsible for the outflow is it a or is it b first you have to answer a or b which is major uh, source of outflow so it is the a the trabecular meshwork is the major outflow system that we have and uveoscleral outflow has a minimal role yes absolutely all are right everybody says a so now we come back to the question that we were trying to answer we have brimonidine we have nitarsodil we have beta blocker timolol and we have prostaglandin analogs so just remember the question is talking about trapecular outflow so when you say prostaglandin analogs please remember it acts on the uveoscleral outflow system so the uveoscleral outflow system which is increased via the pgf2 alpha receptors so now d is not the answer now you tell me okay ankit says b faraz says b med psycho says b act on a absolutely absolutely nitarsodil is a rho kinase inhibitor so basically the rho kinase inhibitors it is the rho kinase inhibitors which act on the trabecular meshwork rest all the other drugs a c and p they act on the trabecular meshwork so they uh, sorry they act on the uveoscleral meshwork not the trabecular they act on the uveoscleral meshwork right so on the trabecular meshwork it is the rho kinase inhibitors and the myotics which work now is that clear so there should be no confusion and tell me the name of the other rho kinase inhibitor we have nitarsodil and the other rho kinase inhibitor that we know of is one is nitarsodil and the other one is the other one is Ripasudil. Yes, very good. Fasudil, I don't know, but okay. So fasudil also you adding, but what we take up is the ones which are US FDA approved. So as of date, as of now, there are only two rho kinase inhibitors which are FDA approved. They are nitarsudil and ripasudil. So they have been approved for use in USA and in japan one was in 2017 the other was in 2019 so these are the two fda approved drugs which are used for glaucoma medications the others have not yet been approved by fda is that clear all right so now you know which acts on the trabecular meshwork and the other meshwork that we have is the uveoscleral meshwork so whenever the question comes about these drugs on 
as an anti glaucoma you have to mention all the drugs which are fda approved so just be careful you cannot just mention any of the drugs okay so there are just two drugs which have been approved for the use anyways now we come down to next question which which says a patient presents with aqueous flare and kps with raised intraocular pressure so best avoided is best avoided is which drug is it prostaglandin analogs beta blockers mannitol and carbonic anhydrase inhibitor so which drug would you avoid to be used for lowering the um, intraocular pressure that means which anti glaucoma medication would you uh, best avoid in a patient of pre existing inflammation this is in short tell me so now you have to look in for a drug which is pro inflammatory so the side effect of one of these drugs is inflammation so tell me which is that drug tell me which is that drug okay so dr swami says b baljinder says c uh, well when we talk of beta blockers please remember beta blockers is something which is um when you talk of beta blockers uh, it is best avoided in patients of asthma in patients of cardiovascular diseases um, because it uh, then it also is um, avoided in patients with uh, hyperlipidemias right that is non selective when we talk of non selective beta blockers okay so now tell me what is the answer anybody now okay so hemant says the answer is a please remember out of all of these the one which is pro inflammatory is prostaglandin this is something which induces inflammation this is something which is notorious to cause cystoid macular edema so please remember it is pro inflammatory and the important point to remember here is whenever the question says that you have a patient who is on anti glaucoma medications like prostaglandin analogs and you need to operate on cataract so the question will ask you what is the next step to be done the first step to be done here is you have to stop prostaglandin analogs okay so that is very important all prostaglandin analog it can be latanoprost it can be travoprost it can be unoprostone bunod it can be uh, uh, bimatoprost any prostaglandin analog for that matter needs to be stopped before you do a cataract surgery the main aim behind that is because it is pro inflammatory is that clear now no mistakes on this is that clear is that okay so now no no mistakes on this right so then we move on to the next one now tell me this is easy identify the image this is something easy what is it tell me what do you see on your screen absolutely by touch spots please remember this is not pterygium this is not pingicula this is a very common point of conversation which i get into ma'am this is pterygium this is pingicula no whenever you talk of pterygium there is a growth which is coming along which is basically causing conjunctivalization of the cornea so that fibrovascular growth that comes on the cornea there is nothing like this it is something which is so beautifully triangular which is in the palpebral area which is present next to the limbus so this is by tort spots and elastotic degeneration is pingicula pterygium is which this is a fibrovascular growth which involves a superficial cornea when it comes over the cornea so it would be coming from the conjunctiva to the cornea so that is pterygium then elastotic degeneration is pingicula and what you get here is 
by touch spots and where do you get the by touch spots that is a sign of xerophthalmia which is caused due to the deficiency of absolutely when which med psycho has already answered it is due to the deficiency of of which vitamin it is because of the deficiency of vitamin a is that clear so this is xerophthalmia so now again you all are right answer is b that is vitamin a deficiency leads to the disease xerophthalmia and the the presentation of xerophthalmia is what you get something like this which is the bitot spots it is a frothy triangular appearance which you get next to the limbus it is simple vitamin a deficiency all right so then we need to move on to this image below image with the characteristic finding can be seen in so before we get to the uh, diagnosis you tell me what is the characteristic finding seen in the image what is the finding which is seen in the image yes so what you get to see here is the cherry red spot cherry red spot and where do you get to see the cherry red spot please do not forget this is very very important the differentials of cherry red spot we have a the, we have the complete mnemonic to remember the entire list you should remember here the most important is crao so here the answer you all know it is crao we have discussed it so many times the entire list the mnemonic should be kept in mind the differentials of cherry red spot are very important so what do you get to see in crao you all know we have a c means cherry red spot we have retinal r means um, there is retinal edema o then a is there is erythromatous plaque which is present and what you get is also there is segmentation there is venous segmentation which is seen right Traf, uh, cattle trucking sign that is called so that is important that is c r a o c means cherry red spot r is the cattle trucking sign which you get a is the atheromatous plaque and o is the edema so this is the central retinal artery occlusion and we all know this is an ocular emergency this is an ocular emergency moving on to the next one we come to this question where there's a 60 year old male presents diagnosis hyper mature cataract underwent cataract surgery so there was a hyper mature cataract operated days later he developed raised intraocular pressure with corneal edema and whitish collection in ac what is the probable diagnosis yes see cherry red spot you are telling i told you there's a complete there's an entire list and there's a mnemonic that you should remember they should keep revising the entire list so that is here so all right so when we come to this question what i have is a a and b so there are a lot of um different answers coming so please note there was a hyper mature cataract the patient has already underwent cataract surgery so the cataract surgery is done so now what now if he develops glaucoma post cataract surgery what kind of glaucoma is it okay let's see it one by one let's discuss it one by one a b all right so there's some sort of confusion let's see so when we talk of phacomorphic let's let's solve it when we talk of phacomorphic we all know phacomorphic means because of the shape and when we talk of because of the shape we are talking of intumescence and when we are talking of intumescence we are talking of a cataract which is intumescent which results in phacomorphic glaucoma so a mature cataract when it becomes intumescent it is going to give you phacomorphic glaucoma which is not the scenario because it itself is, it is a hyper mature cataract and it has been operated so this cannot be the answer then we come to phaco lytic glaucoma now phaco lytic glaucoma this is seen in cases of hyper 
mature cataract and this phacolytic glaucoma is also called as lens protein glaucoma why because of there are changes in the um, lens protein there are more uh, concentration of insoluble lens proteins so that is hypermature cataract but now the question says the patient has been operated for hypermature cataract so it's not even phacolytic glaucoma and it is not lens protein glaucoma the answer is lens particle glaucoma this is exactly what I wanted to tell you. So now the catch point here is that the patient has been operated for cataract surgery. Had it just been talking about hypermature cataract, it would have been a phacolytic or a lens protein glaucoma. But once the patient has been operated for cataract surgery and later he presents to you with with glaucoma or with the signs of glaucoma that means there are certain parts of the lens uh, which has been left behind for example the maybe the cortical matter which has gone into the interior chamber has blocked the angle and is now presenting with glaucoma so that is lens particle glaucoma is this clear now there's no confusion on this question is that clear no confusions now So now you you see there is it is not A, it is not B, it is lens particle glaucoma. So with all these such concepts, you should be very clear what are we dealing with. Unless and until you read the question properly, you read what the what they want to know, what the examiner wants to know, you will be in a fix. Right? So I end up with this image. Tell me what is it? This is the starry sky appearance and identify this image. Which image is this? What image this image is telling you? This is a beautiful starry sky appearance. What do you see in this image? Tell me. What do you see in this image? So just concentrate on the periphery. What are these? Yes, it is laser treated. Please note this is not retinitis pigmentosa. This is the laser treatment. And what kind of a laser has been done here? Can you name the laser? Which kind of laser application is done? Is it macular? Is it focal? Or is it a panretinal photocoagulation? Yes. So this is a panretinal photocoagulation or which is famously called as PRP. Tell me one disease which is very common where you do a PRP is. So any diseases where you get neovascularization. Can you name some diseases where you get uh, to see the neovascularization? So this has been done. Please note this has been done on the retina. This is not on the iris. So this is retinal PRP which is done. Yes, it is diabetic retinopathy. These are the vascular occlusions, BRVO, CRVO. You get to see this. You have vasculitis, all the occlusion, sickle cell disease, all the things which cause occlusion, which result in increase in VEGF and further neovascularization. You will get to see the pan retinal photocoagulation. Then, this is the last slide for the day. Tell me when you see on histopathology a keratin pearl. A keratin pearl which is seen like this, what is the diagnosis? In which kind of disease? Name the disease where you get keratin pearls on histopathology. Uh, okay, uh, AMD, no, we do not do age-related macular degeneration. We do not do a PRP. It is more specifically a macular disease. So then uh, panretinal photocoagulation is not done. Right? So keratin pearl is seen in which kind of a disease? Anyone? Okay. So the first thing that comes to from my side is it is an eyelid malignancy. It's 
So now if you want to trend, which which kind of a disease will present to you with keratin pearl? Yes, it is the squamous cell carcinoma. So keratin pearl is seen in squamous cell carcinoma. And which disease do you call as rodent ulcer? Which eyelid malignancy is called as rodent ulcer? Now the answer is basal cell carcinoma. Okay, so this is basal cell carcinoma. So that is it for uh, this session. And as I always say, the FMG date is approaching and I have got so many requests to cover a few topics separately in detail, which I would be taking starting from July 11. So this is starting from July 11. This is an advanced course on ophthalmology, which is an edge over the others. The topics to be covered here would be lasers and ophthalmology, which has been asked so many times by so many students. So, and I'm taking that here, eye banking, keratoplasty, Horner's syndrome, retinopathy of prematurity, CSR, and detailed analysis of the study of national blindness and visual impairment survey 2015-19 with amblyopia. So this I am starting. So this I already told you there will be two sessions which will be one and a half hours each. So just, I will not take a lot of time before I know your the, the, the important date is 30th July. So we have two classes, 11th July and 18th of July. So this is going to be on an academy app. We will discuss these topics in details because these are the anticipated topics. These are the topics which will have some questions to surely coming up so we will discuss these topic in details. The two classes will be on the Unacademy app. So if you are interested, you can enroll for this session and it will be good for you. Uh, all right. Thank you so much. It was nice uh, being so interactive because I always believe that one-sided teaching becomes a little monotonous. We all gain with it when we interact. We make mistakes and we gain. So till then, I wish you all the best. Keep studying hard. Keep working hard. There are no shortcuts for hard work. We all have gone through and we can go through it again. Right? So I wish you all the best. See you again. Take care. Bye-bye.